Okay, um, back on Space Telescope today, and what we're looking at is the original. Well, this was the plan before. This um, this is the 50% theoretical 50% maximum duty cycle on our PID, not our PID, but our pulse width modulator. This in this uh, original design, this L1 fed previous designs that was uh, this was L2. They fed that, of course, and this is the um, the voltage multiplier network. So, and it was an isolated scheme. And the thing is, and theoretically, we can only get 50% maximum duty cycle. So, I've got a transformer here. Transformer is like one of the biggest pieces of uh, of this board. I mean, it's bigger than anything else. So the transformer is going to be a lot of cost and weight, mass, and so uh, having just 50 percent, and that's only theoretical because in reality, if you remember the other videos we played back, we were only getting about 25 or 35 percent at most. So we were not getting full use of this transformer, and I kept going around and looking around for another topology that I could use and there were various uh, techniques that we could try adding another inductor or another uh, phase onto the uh, transformer and using that to drain off some of the energy because what happens if you go over 50 percent and in the case in real life it goes over 35 percent and the transformer goes into saturation and it no longer performs and, and just sucks up a lot of energy which is is not too good. So the solution, um, I, I, I just stumbled upon this other uh, topology here, and what that was was just to simply as just to this. Okay, so here's the new talk about topology right here. Now that what this does is um, I've got and this actually this actually gives me a hundred percent. This gives me one hundred percent theoretical maximum, um, and perhaps even more with the um, or less, perhaps a bit less. I mean, there's obviously we're not obviously we're not getting more than a hundred percent, but um, perhaps ninety or even eighty percent. Uh, duty cycle out of this one, and the way this one works is that I get both of these, both of these uh, sides of this transformer. This is basically a center tap transformer. So this is a ten to one ratio. The uh, one is on this side. So what happens is when we have now we have two gates driving, or we have two devices switches operating this one side of this transformer. It's basically the equivalent of a center tap transformer. Kind of looks like that right there. Here's our center tap transformer. You've got one, and it's basically a 20 volt to 115 V8 volt transformer. I'm using one off the shelf because I haven't got one designed yet. This is going to be a bit of work. But 20 volts across, and you get 10 volts here, 10 volts here, which is going to be 100 volts over here, and it'll be 1100 volts over on this side. So when I push 10 volts, and basically the center tap goes to a 100 volt feeder. So when I'm switching, when I'm switching this side over here, the one side is the current is coming down through this side. The current is turned off on that one, and then when it's and that switches off and while that one's resting, then I switch to this one on. And with this, with this design, I can get a full 100% uh, usage of this transformer. I can get it working. Now, um, how do we drive this? Of course, now the circuit's a little more complicated. I have not one gate. I have gate one, and now I have gate two. Now, one of the complications here is that you can't have them on both at the same time. Now, the uh, PID controller is, <laughs> you'll notice this says PID number one, because now there are two PID controllers. Um, and there's a reason for that, we'll talk about it in a second. But this PID controller basically adjusts the pulse width. This uh, says the maximum, uh, 10 volts maximum over here, which is controlled by that, by this little Zener diode over here. 
And here's our first pulse width modulator. Notice this is gate one. And now we have two of these. We need one for each side. Alright, so these have to be triggered. And the trigger on this, what, what that does is it triggers this, it turns this device on. And I also have to make sure this one is not on at the same time this one's on. So the trigger to this one is also the reset or the cutoff to this one. So if this one happens to be on, when I trigger this one, it's going to turn this one off. The same thing is the other way. This is trigger two. The trigger turns this one on, but at the same time it turns this one on, if this one happens to still be on, it turns it off. So both of these can't be on at the same time, or both gates cannot be turned on at the same time. These are driven by, now because these circuits here, these are 12 volt driven devices, and the ones, the devices that are going to control when those triggers are, are 3.9 volt devices, or 3.6 volt. This is a, this one takes a 3.6 volt supply. Here it is, 3.6 volts. And this one takes a 12 volt supply. So now I need an interface between these two devices, and that little 2222 takes care of that. The other part of this is that we need a trigger and we need a really skinny one. And that's all it does, it's just a trigger. So this little um, 74LV123, and it's 123, you may be familiar with that, puts out a tiny little pulse. That all it does is turn on this little transistor and it fires this NE555 timer. That is based on the input to this right here. Now that comes from Q, Q output of this device. But this device is turned on, and of course there are two of them, right? Both of these are, are set up the same way, but they're driven by different signals. This one is driven by the QZ output, this, this right here, QZ, which is the Q bar, the, op, the inverse of Q. So that then this one is high, the Q output is low. And when the Q output is high, the Q bar output is low. So this is one QA and one QZ. So this is edge driven. That is when the, when this signal here, Q uh, one QZ, goes low or high, I think it goes high. When this signal goes high, this is an edge driven chip here and it causes this pulse to get generated so that it doesn't run the entire period of this pulse. It already runs uh, for as long as this little timing network is set up to run. This is set up the same way. This is the second. This, this applies trigger two. And this also does the same thing, only its pulse is going to be driven, or its, um, its high going uh, edge is going to be exactly uh, the opposite of what this is. Now this also has to be supplied, and this is supplying the Q. This is just a D flip flop. So what happens is it takes in a clock, which is represented as clock right here which is represented by this little trigger. Once again, we use another 2 and 22 because this is a 3.6 volt device and now we have to knock this down from a 3.6 volt supply from a 12 volt device. We have to go back into a 3.6 volt device. We can't mix these. These are analog and digital components. So we're mixing analog and digital together. So what we have is just another NE555. This one is in a different configuration. It's not in the configuration of a pulse width modulator. Instead, it is just a clock generator. And it generates this clock not at 100 kilohertz anymore. Now it generates at 200 kilohertz. This D flip-flop takes that. Okay, so just 200 kilohertz, just free, free, op or free runs at 200 kilohertz and it goes into this and it operates this as basically a divide by two. So what comes out of this is these two, the Q and QZ, 
at 100 kilohertz each. So this system runs at 100 kilohertz, but it starts with a 200 kilohertz clock. Last but not least, one of the problems with uh, using a pulse width modulator, you can get up to 99% pulse width or down to 1% or very low pulse width, but you can't get to a zero pulse width. And somewhere along the line, you're going to want to turn that pulse off. And that's what it does. We use our sense and our input lines to regulate when this thing is just going to say, okay, it's time to shut off. Well, this is also PID number two, and I still have a few um, calculations to do. I need to work out the algorithm for these two PID controllers. This one determines when this is going to be shut off and when it's going to get turned back on. What that does, yet again, this is a 12 volt circuit feeding into a 3.6 volt circuit, so we need another 2222. This goes up to whenever this is off, this pulls this down to zero and clear Z which is a bar, clear Z means it's clear bar, it turns this entire chip off. So once this chip is turned off, none of the rest of the circuit will operate. That is, none of the rest of these gates will turn off. They'll just, they'll be turned off and will stop generating a pulse. That happens whenever we get up to our maximum voltage and we don't need any more. Okay, so where do, where do these signals come from? Here again, we have the sense input and the, uh, the sense and the input. The input here controls what voltage we want to set it to. Right now, this input voltage is set to, to go off at 4,000 volts. The sense comes from over here, where it senses we have a 10 meg and a 5k. When this gets to 4,000 volts, it should put out about a 2 volt signal. So, um, of course, this is where our, our storage, part of our storage, uh, for 1,000 picofarad capacitors. All right, so that's that. That's the new design. This is the new typology. Um, this seems to be the way that uh, I'd like it to go. And it seems to be working in theory. So let's take a look at what it's doing. So I can see here that it gets up, this is 4.4K over here, and it gets up to 4,000 volts very, very quickly. And it does it in about five milliseconds. Now, in previous um, topologies, this was not quite working very actually it's doing it in less than five milliseconds, about four point eight, four point seven milliseconds. In the meantime we're still watching the sense and the sense gets out to here, it doesn't immediately drop. It should drop almost as soon as this thing it should go down to zero very quickly, but it's not doing that. It is however going down to about one volt over here which is good. Now the other part of this is that when these things are going here's what's happening on this stuff right here. Look how here's what the clocks look like. Here's what the the gates. This is gate one, gate two. When this one is on, it is on 50 percent of the duty cycle. Then the other one comes on and this one shuts off and then gate two, or gate well, let's say gate two comes on, but it's really gate one comes on, and then as soon as gate two comes on, this one shuts off. So these are almost back to back. Now what happens when this gets um, when this gets out here a little further, and it says, well, we're sort of now. Look what happens. This is as thin as these can get. This is gate gate two, gate one, gate two, gate one. And these are very far apart. So we're not getting, these are about maybe 15% duty cycle, which is about almost all we can get out of here. In the meantime, what has happened to our current? This is, this is the beauty of this whole thing. Our current has gone down, I'm just curious here. Uh, no, I'm not. Um, our current has dropped very far. The current on the two transformer windings that we were so worried about, because it overloads to up to, it basically takes as much as the power supply can put out, overloads to 4 amps. What is it doing now? This one is minus, it's about 1.23 amps, it's in the negative. 
it pops up to a spike of 109 amps. Now a tiny little spike is not going to hurt a transformer in general unless the voltage is too high. This one drops down to again now yeah, let's do let's take this down because I know this was less than minus one point. This was pretty close to zero amps. Okay, that's zero point seven seven amps. So seventy hundred and seventy milliamps. But I'm pretty sure these are closer to zero. If I look at this a little bit closer, let's uh arrange have a look. And what we get is 0 0.023 amps, or 23 milliamps. So that is a very tiny compared to what we were getting before. Now we do get this big giant uh, spikes, these spikes right here, but I guess we'll have to wait and see. Most, most transformers are very tolerant of these current spikes. So these right up around 120, I guess. This one is scoring up to 120 uh, amps. Not many amps, amps. But it's a spike. It's a current spike. And that current spike is what produces this voltage spike. Alright, so there's the new topology, the new design. And um, in the other box over here, I've got the parts list. I've got everything that I need for this all ready to be ordered, including two transformers. Um, and this was this is the more expensive part. These are eight dollars a piece for these smaller ones that are taller. They've got about a 300 milliamp. These are all these are both center. This 20 volt center tap, 20 volt center tap right there, and this is a 24 volt center tap which would produce a smaller voltage on the output but it's a 500 milliamp which is about half an amp tolerance. This one's got about 300 which is about one third of an amp tolerance. And this one also can take 115 to 230 so I can actually kick this up from 10 volts up to oh 2000 volts easily. These are eight dollars and eleven cents each. These are 957 each, so it's a little expensive. I mean, the resistors here I'm buying 10 for 46 cents. There I'm buying these resistors uh, 10 for 20 for a dollar 52. Here I'm buying these little resistors 40 for a dollar 76. They're cheap, and then the chips, capacitors are about the same, 10 of them for a dollar 31. Here are the uh, LM358s. Those are that's the uh, those are the op amps that are going to be the PID controllers, and those are ten for three thirty, so thirty three cents a piece. So really, the transformer is the more expensive thing. Even these chips here, the seventy four seventy four, is going to be three dollars and fifty cents. They're thirty five cents a piece. And the LM339s, we were burning those. I got 10 of them here for 38 cents a piece. So, uh, and 123s, those are 41 cents a piece. Um, before we were frying these with the high voltage, I, I'm going to have to do this a little bit differently now. But you can see when I'm paying 35 cents a piece for all these chips, and then I'm paying eight dollars for one transformer, and I need eight of these, whichever one I choose. It's I don't know which one is going to be more tolerant of this, because um, right now these are not designed for producing a thousand volts on the input coil. I'm going to put a hundred volts across these input coil windings, and hopefully they don't blow up. So. Um, I'm paying most attention to the features. Basically, what they say: what's the resistance across this, or not the the? Um, uh, where was? It? I'm just looking at one of these, and they will tell us the. Uh, no, well, it's going to tell us what, how much. Um, 
voltage it will tolerate. Uh, well, let's go back and look which one it is. That's like this one right here. A lot of these will change. Here's the triad magnetics. This one has, what's it say? It's high pot tested to 4200 volts RMS, primary and secondary. This is a res the, the voltage test uh, that prevents arcing between the primary and the secondary. And then from here it's 2000 volts RMS, secondary to secondary. So what this is, is how much voltage these things can tolerate from one side to the other. And this says up to 4200 volts, uh, or 4000, a little over 4000. The other one says from secondary to secondary, 2000. So uh, when I'm putting 100 volts across those secondaries, but separating them, I, I should be clear of an arc. Well, theoretically speaking. Now this particular one is the 24 volt, but I think the one that I'm using is, the one that I'm really interested in is this, this 20 volt, and that's also 4200 volts RMS primary. So, uh, what they call high pot test into 4000 volts and, and uh, 2000 volts, respectively. And here's the, of course, the, this is basically the data sheet. What this thing doesn't give me is some very important information, which is the um, inductance. It doesn't tell me the a inductance, but it says 6 VA. So I have secondaries of 10 volts at 0.3 amps or 300 milliamps each. Now, can I, can I get that higher? Yes. And every time it goes up, you get a bigger transformer and it costs more and it costs more to ship. So, um, I'm going to shoot after the least expensive, obviously, and I may end up burning through both of these transformers and having to buy a more expensive one. They're definitely not being used <laughs> the way they're supposed to be used. But once I once I can prove the concept here, I can um, uh, it's back to the Chinese vendors and put out a bid and see who can build me one that has a, a 100 volt input dual primaries and a 1000 volt single um, secondary. So, alright, well, that's it. I'm back to Bob, and today this is what we're working on. This, we are trying to, I'm still working out the, the, um, the PID controllers, and I have to develop, I've gotten some old texts out, and this is, um, this is uh, pretty common text now. It's, this, this is basically I'm going to have to go through and figure out exactly how I want to. So I have to go through and come up with this sort of diagram and how I want to. Right now I'm using proportional integral derivative and I could get back to the circuit and explain how that circuit works. But essentially there are three parts. One is a proportional, one is the integration, and one is the derivation. And that's back on this guy right here and you'll see PID you'll see a PID in all three of these so um, this one has proportional um, integral and derivative it's got I think this one is integral and this is derivative so um, all three are right here and then of course this sets the anyway uh, more calculations. This this actually requires some me going back and re <laughs> remembering. You know, it's funny as I made an A in this class when I took it uh, for a master or bachelor's uh, for engineering, electrical engineering, and then I also had this is one book I had. And that was for electrical engineering and for the engineering technology course. Now I've got two of these books here. This one is Bateson. So this one is Dorsey and this one is Bateson. And Bateson's been around forever. He's been writing feedback control systems. This is an introduction to, introduction to control system technology. So this is a course that I took back in 1980. I don't have to go back through and remember all this stuff. And of course, here's here's all that stuff that they're talking about in this course. Um, this course I took in probably 2000 and 
Right, 2000. <laughs> so 19 years ago, it's been a while. Um, all this still looks a little bit familiar to me, but I have to go back and review it and remember how things came together. So it's been a long time since I've worked it. I said before in some of my other videos that this, this entire field is relatively complex and if you're really good at PID controls or if you're really good at feedback control systems you can make a whole career out of this. I mean there are people who there are engineers out there who they get really good at this and the company can't live without them because they're the only ones who understand this. This tough stuff. That's fun. I aced both of these courses and <laughs> I thought I was going to fail both of them, and I ended up getting A's in both of them. I'm like, this is insane. How do you get an A? I'm, I'm, I'm a D student. I'm a horrible student. So how do I get an A in courses that I think are going to kill me? So, anyway, this is Dr. Bob. Y'all have a great day, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Oh, yeah, and I uh, forgot. I almost forgot. Working on protecting, saving, let's try again, saving my ass and yours from space aliens and asteroids. Have a great day. Thanks for watching my program. If you like my videos, be sure and subscribe to my YouTube channel. And for an organized listing of my YouTube videos, go to my website www.wherearemyplacebos.com and click on videos. Have a great day.